If you ask me to name just one wonder that Unix or Linux has brought to us, I would probably say the pipe. And in this next section, we're going to look at anonymous pipes, pipes that have no name. Pipes are probably the most widely used inter-process communication mechanism in Linux, and they're at the heart of this uh, tool-building philosophy that you see in Unix and Linux, this approach of, of combining tools to do the job. And we all know how to create them from the command line. In fact, some people refer to this vertical bar character as the pipe symbol, because that's essentially all they use it for. Pipes are unidirectional. They have a, an upstream end that you write to and a downstream end that you read from. They have a capacity. They provide buffering. And they also impose a loose synchronization between the producer, the, the one writing to the upstream end of the pipe, and the consumer, the one that's reading from the downstream end. Because if the producer tries to write to the pipe and the pipe is full, it will block until the consumer has consumed some of the data. Conversely, if the consumer tries to read from the pipe when it is empty, then it will block until the producer has written some more data. And importantly, the consumer will only see an end of file indication when it reads from the pipe when the producer has actually closed its descriptor on the upstream end. I'll come back to that point in a moment. Creating a pipe is easy. You need a, an array of two integers, which I call P here, and you pass it to the pipe system call. And what you get back are two file descriptors. P1 is the descriptor on the upstream end, and P0 on the downstream end. The return value from pipe itself is just zero on success, minus one on error. Now, here's something that at first sight looks completely irrelevant, but which actually turns out to be important. I want to talk about two system calls called dupe and dupe2. Dupe takes a file descriptor and it makes a copy of it onto the lowest available descriptor. In other words, the smallest descriptor that's not actually open. Dupe2 does the same job, but you actually get to specify via that second argument which descriptor you want to duplicate onto. If that descriptor is already open, it will get closed first. Notice that after calling dupe or dupe2, these two file descriptors are exactly equivalent. So, for example, writing onto one of them will advance the file position marker as seen by the other descriptor. The return value from both of these calls is simply the new descriptor. Let's see how we can use this to redirect standard input, say. Now we know how to do that from the shell command prompt, but let's see how we do it from within a program. Show you two ways. Here we're going to uh, connect our standard input to the file foo. We begin by opening the file, we get back as to regular file descriptor fd, we close file descriptor 0, that's our standard input. We then dupe fd. Now we can be absolutely certain that at that point in time descriptor 0 is the lowest available descriptor because we've just closed it. So fd will get duplicated onto the standard input. So the standard input is now connected to the file foo. Using dupe2 is slightly easier because we don't need to explicitly close uh, descriptor 0 first. We just dupe the file descriptor onto standard input descriptor 0, but the net result is exactly the same. Now, if we start to use this kind of trick to manipulate the file descriptors on the ends of a pipe, things start to get really interesting. Let me talk you through the typical sequence of events when we create and use an anonymous pipe. We start here with a process which I call A. It begins by creating the pipe and it gets back descriptors on the two ends of the pipe. It then forks the new process I've called B. Now it's very important to note that the child process inherits the descriptors from the parent. So it also has descriptors open on the two ends of the pipe. 
Now you can do this either way round, but in this case I've got the parent is destined to become the downstream process. So it duplicates the downstream end of the pipe, P0, onto its standard input, and it closes its handle on the upstream end. It will then probably go away and exec whatever it wants the downstream program to be. The child process, that is B in the picture, is going to become the upstream process, so it duplicates the upstream end of the pipe onto file descriptor 1, which is its standard output. It then closes the descriptor on the downstream end. And then it execs whatever it wants the upstream program to be. Now, one rather non-obvious point is that it's important to close the descriptors that you don't need, particularly the descriptors on the upstream end of the pipe. Because if you leave one open, even if you've no intention of ever writing to it, the downstream program will never see an end of file coming back when it tries to read from the pipe. And typically, the whole thing just hangs up. And although it's some years ago now, I remember wasting a lot of time before I figured out that behaviour. The uh, other point I wanted to make is that the programs that are exact here as the upstream and downstream programs have no idea that all is fiddling about with the file descriptors has been going on. Uh, they just inherit their standard input, standard output connections and go ahead and read and write them as normal.